supported several sides and tracks for RCA Victor with the Lonesome Pine Feathers. And he served our great nation as a member of the very new Air Force in the mid 1950s. Yeah. After the Air Force, you landed right back in the Bluefield area and you got a phone call from an old boy that you'd crossed paths with a couple times and he wound up in Detroit because he went to Detroit working with the Osborne brothers. He wound up just with his own show up there in Detroit and that was Jimmy Martin and his Sunny Mountain Boys. Yes. Jim tracked you down in the fall of 1957, right? Right, I had uh, I got out of the military and I stayed around home there in Wythe County, Virginia a little while. <coughs> Wasn't well, nothing going on, and Ezra and uh, Lost Pine Fiddlers at Pikeville, Kentucky, WLSI. And I told Mom and Dad, I said, I think I'll go up there and visit Ezra. And so I did, and I caught the Asian flu while I was there. So many people died from that Asian flu, and, and I caught the Asian flu, and I've never been so sick in my life, but uh, it, it hurt to touch your skin or your hair or anything. And, even your eyes, it hurt to move your eyes. And I didn't know what had happened. You couldn't get in a clinic. You couldn't get in a hospital. They just said, take aspirin, drink fluids, don't come to the hospital, we don't have nothing, no more to put you or nothing. So, but people were dying everywhere from the Asian flu. So I was staying in a little mobile unit there in a trailer park, and Margaret, Andrew Klein's wife, she came up there one morning and she had a murky looking concoction in a glass. And I'd seen muddy water that looked pretty much like what she had in that glass. And she said, Paul, I want you to drink this. I said, what is it? She said, you don't need to know what it is. <laughs> Just drink it and I want to cover you up. And don't you get up for nothing. And she put enough cover on me that it would have took a whole lot for me to try to get up. <laughs> She said, I don't want you to get up for nothing. Well, sometime before daylight, I woke up and my pajamas was wet. My undershirt was wet. And the sheet next to me was damp. And I felt a little different. I felt, felt like I might get better. A little while after that, that door opened. She come in there and slapped her hand on my forehead. Well, thank God we broke the fever. I said, well, that's, that's good. <laughs> but I don't want you up fanning around. I said, well, I, I'm not going to get up unless I have to. And I said, can I ask you a question? Sure. Are you feeling good? I said, yeah, I feel good. What's your question? I said, well, what was that stuff? You don't need to know what that was. <laughs> I said, well, I'd just like to know. I said, she said, you don't need to know. It worked, and that's the only thing you need to know. So to this day, I don't know what I drank, <laughs> but it got me over the Asian flu. Well, Martin, had you come to Detroit, you said uh, you got up there to get better acquainted with Jimmy and his show and what his expectations were, working the honky-tonks in Detroit, Michigan in late 1957. Right. And you said when you got to Jimmy's house that there was a kid laid on the couch that you met for the first time that day. Yeah, he's a skinny, red-headed boy. Flingo. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy introduced him to me as J.D. Crow. And uh, said he, he, he did, plays a banjo for me, Paul. I said, okay. So uh, we got acquainted, sat around and talked for a while. And uh, I'm trying to make a long story short. Uh, J.D. really helped me to uh, know what Jimmy expected of me. Because while I was in the military overseas in Japan and Korea, I had a Western band. I played electric guitar. And we played the Sergeant Ironman's Club over there. I was on flying status and I was an airborne radio operator flew in and out of Korea, all over the Far East, Formosa, the Philippines, and Okinawa, and Guam, all over. But uh, and when I wasn't gone from my home base, I had a Western band at the club that we played down there. But, but anyway, uh, J.D. sat down with me and told me 
what Jimmy expected, and Jimmy had some recordings that he would play for me on the studio, let me listen to kind of, cause I had, I had been listening to bluegrass music since I went, <coughs> left the Lost Pine Fillers in Detroit, went in the military, which was four years, and uh, so uh, J.D. really helped me about uh, what Jimmy expected to me on the mantle, and uh, I wasn't sure whether I could do tenor or not. I'd been singing them low country songs, you know. So I didn't know whether I could do tenor anymore or not. But uh, we got to working on that, and, and we would practice. I think he'd done it for my benefit, but he had about three hours every day. But uh, uh, J.D. was uh, helped me a lot about the arrangements and uh, playing what recordings they had out. And so uh, they got me molded into being a Sunny Mountain boy. And, and that was in the fall of, of uh, 57. Come December, Jimmy said, I want you to go home and uh, with me and meet my folks down in Sneeville, Tennessee. And I said, I, I think I'll hang around up here, Jimmy. I, I'm not much into traveling right now. I said, you don't want to hang around up here. There ain't nothing going on. He said, go with me down there. And I said, oh, I want you to meet my folks. I said, well, okay. And reluctantly, I said, I'll go. So, and we rode down to Hancock County, Tennessee. And I met his stepdad and his mom and his brothers and sisters. And that's where I met my wife. <laughs> and uh, she caught my eye, but uh, I didn't hardly want to let on. But I said, boy, it's a pretty girl. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, that's where that's when we met, and uh, that was the fifty-seven. Five years later, December the fourth, we were married. And this December the fourth, if it be the Lord's will, we'll be married fifty-six years. <laughs> I thought about when I got saved in the last Sunday in August '63, the best thing that ever happened to me. She's the next best thing ever yeah, happened. That's right. And the Lord blessed our home with a son. And I'm so proud of him. And Paul, you and I have talked a lot. You told me on the way back to Detroit with Martin after that first Christmas down in the hills. Yeah. First time you had the blessing of getting acquainted with your dear, sweet wife, Edrick. So on the way back to Detroit, you started humming a little song in the back of Jimmy's car. Write down some words, and if you're if you're a, a nut like me that loves the history behind classic bluegrass songs, how did it go, Paul? What was it? It was old-fashioned Christmas. Yeah. Um, I can't get it on my mind right now. I can see. I can see the holly in the wind. Yeah. yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Deca Deca Records. Had a country Christmas LP. It's one of the only Christmas LPs in my, in my mom and dad's household when I was growing up. And it had Webb Pierce and Ernest Tubb and all the stars of Decca Records. But when Jimmy the Sunday Mountain Boy started singing, I can see the holly in the window. Yeah. It really touched everybody. Decorations on the tree. Good stuff. Good stuff. Stockings on by the park. Yes, sir. Well, that was a kind of a mental picture I got while I was there visiting at Christmas time. So, going back to what I was talking about songwriting a while ago, those words came to me as we was going back to Michigan. So, I run them around in my brain until I got a chance where I could write them down. I had nothing to write them to. But uh, that's how that song came to be. And when I got it to, to where I thought it was done, and I sang it to Jimmy, and of course he said, well, I don't know whether they'll let us do a Christmas song or not, but he said, I'm gonna try my best to get Owen Bradley to let me do that song. He said, Owen Bradley then was the uh, a and man for, for Decca Records in, in Nashville. So next time we went to do a session, why, we hit uh, J.D. and myself, we, uh, we done that song. We had it worked out pretty good. And uh, Owen said, why not? Jimmy didn't think he'd let us do a Christmas song, but when Owen heard it, he said, why not? It might be all right, Jimmy. 
So that's how that came about. Well, most folks know that you made history in a big way alongside JB and JD. It's one of the strongest bodies of work in the whole bluegrass canon. So many songs that are sang at jam sessions worldwide, day and night. I named a few of them last night in induction, like my walking shoes don't fit me anymore. Paul and I were visiting a few years ago. So those years on the road with Martin, so you wound up in a little old lonely hotel room in some town. So it was just breaking daylight, you heard the train come through the town cross. I did. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'd leave it up, but I heard the, it was a breaking day, and uh, I heard this train whistle. This uh, lonesome sound. So I wrote Mr. Engineer. <laughs> Reach up and pull the whistle. Oh. Let me hear that lonesome sound. For it blends with the feeling that within me, the one I love is turning me. <laughs> well, your tenure with the Sunny Mountain Boys took a different direction, as you said, when you had a wonderful experience of grace and salvation yes. in 1963. You stayed with Martin Show almost till the end of that year. You wound up on that last tour, you gave Jimmy your notice, said, well, I'll, I'll work out these last show dates there in, in the late fall of 1963. You wound up way up in northern Canada and across Alaska, didn't you? Well, uh, he had a, when I got saved, the wife and I was in Hancock County. I got saved at a little church I called Painter Creek, Missionary Baptist. But that morning I couldn't told you the name of the church or anything. I just knew that I was lost and I needed God. So that was the foremost thing in my life. But when we got back home that day, uh, Jimmy, he had uh, a 29 day tour. And I felt like I needed to get out of the music because back then we played a lot of bars and dives and things and I didn't think I could be an effective witness uh, being in those places so I felt like I needed to withdraw from that but anyway I told him that uh, I said I know you can't get anybody ready for this tour in just a few days so uh, I said I'll help you do the tour and when I get back I said I'm done and at that time he had hired a young man out of Hancock County to play the banjo by the name of Doyle Lawson. And I was living in Donaldson Hills, me and my wife. And he said, oh, don't you take this boy out there to your house and uh, show him those kickoffs and breaks on the banjo. I said, okay. We just had a few days to get him ready. So uh, we do that about two or three hours a day. And Jim said one day, he said, how's he coming along on the banjo? I said, well, he's, he's doing pretty good. But I said, every time I get done with a rehearsal, he wants to play my band. And he said, look, I don't need a band player. I said, I know, I know. But I said, he, he likes the band. And he said, well, he's got to play banjo for me. And I said, well, we're, we're working on it. I said, we're getting there. We're getting there. And we did. We did. He said, no, he's no, very gifted. He can play about anything. Yeah. But... Uh, we got, we got him ready. And uh, Doyle just got married then. He married a girl from Bean Station, Tennessee, Christine Coffey. And uh, we was in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. I'll never forget it. It was mean to me. And I have apologized to Doyle <laughs> since then. But it was mean to me. He was sitting there looking out the window. And he looked about as sad as anything I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, he just got married, left his bride behind. And I went over and I said, oh, we ain't got for 24 more days. <laughs> <laughs> and he just dropped his head in first. <laughs> but that was bad. I shouldn't have done that. But I apologize to him, but we had, we had a great tour, and when we got back to Nashville, I, 
I did uh, quit, and the Edward and I, we put our house up for sale, put our furniture in storage, and moved back to Hancock County for a while. Worked at different jobs in uh, construction, worked for our department, worked for the city of Marstown for a while, and uh, worked for the housing authority, and, but, uh, I guess uh, to kind of sum it all up, I, I didn't stop singing. I uh, became a member of uh, Northside Missionary Baptist Church in Morristown. And I was elected choir leader. So I led the choir for a long, long time. And uh, the pastor had a broadcast on a local station uh, 8.30 from Orton to West Earl on Sunday morning for 24 years. We had an acapella quartet. We sang in homecomings, funerals. <clears throat> they were due to last sing at a wedding. I don't know why. But uh, <laughs> but we sung in homecomings and uh, revivals and things like that. But I, I stayed active singing. And uh, I got to uh, I got a work uh, job at the post office in uh, 76 and so I went to work for the United Postal Service and uh, I retired from there in uh, April 1st of 95 and I had written some uh, gospel songs and Dole in the meantime he, he had uh, <coughs> done one of my songs I'd written at that time, so we'll go home together on the cloud. And uh, he had recorded that. But uh, <clears throat> I prayed about what I thought I needed to do. I had several songs, and I had a desire in my heart to form maybe a trio and, and go around and, uh, and sing uh, these songs because some of the quartet that we had had passed on. And, uh, so I prayed about it, and I felt, I felt good in my heart about it, so I did. And we formed the Victory Trio. We arrived at that name because we were all born again, and we all had the victory, so we, there's three of us, so we called it the Victory Trio. And <clears throat> so we, we did that for a long time, and Dave Freeman heard a CD that I made and produced, just first one they ever did. Uh, but, uh, Dave Freeman heard at Rebel Records, and he called me one day. Said he wanted to put our music out on his label, and want to know what I thought about it. And I said, "Well, it sounds good to me." And he said, "Well, I've been I know about your career ever since you was with the Lonesome Five Fiddlers. I know a lot about you." And I said, "Well," he said, "Do me one favor." He said, "You've got ten songs on this CD." He said, "Would you go back in the studio?" where you recorded it and put me four more songs on there so we won't have any variation of sound. I said, sure. So we did that and had it mastered and everything and sent it to him. And he, uh, he called it Old Ways and Old Paths. And it was nominated for a Grammy in the year 2000. Yeah. And uh, that's how our career got started with Rebel. We done about 12, 10 or 12 CDs for Mr. Freeman. They, they've been good to me. Uh, Dave Freeman has been a real help to me in my career. And I appreciate him. But uh, that's where we are to now. Those songs have blessed a lot of people. Let's say this before we dive in and have Ricky tell us a few things. I, Ricky, I can remember being six, seven years old. And uh, Back then, people didn't wear seat belts too much. Dad always had an old Pontiac or a Cadillac of some kind. The armrest, when you're a little kid, you could sit on the armrest next to that, you know. Always had a big eight-track player going wide open. And if it was Jimmy Martin or the Sunny Mountain Boys, Dad would point to, point to the dash and he'd say, if you ever decide to sing tenor, that's the way you're supposed to do it, right there. <laughs> and it was Paul Williams. How about the Brother Paul? We know not only the, the few of us gathered in this room, but the world certainly familiar with the career of one of the uh, most awarded artists 
uh, in anything connected to bluegrass and country and gospel music, and that's Ricky Skaggs. Most of us know Ricky's heart. Most of us know uh, what, how generous he is with his time and his talent. We know also how many people he has mentored. Uh, but it's really unique, and I hadn't thought about this as preparing for our session this morning and how their paths do intersect when, we, when Paul mentions the names J.D. Crow and Doyle Lawson. Ricky is a young man who will work with both of those guys very extensively, as we know.